because there's a whole parallel Jamaican connection which uh, of of blacks who came to to build the canal. Yeah. I met someone, I was walking around and this guy tried to be a, kind of a tour guide, he wanted to be a tour guide, older man. And he starts speaking to us in English, again, totally Jamaican accent. And yeah. he said, I've never been to Jamaica. Huh. <laughs> he grew up in the canal zone to, to his I parents. I had a neighbor friend here who wrote her memoir of growing up in Jamaica, uh, in, in Panama. In Panama? Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Her name is Marlena Baraf, B-A-R-A-F. Jewish? Jewish, but yeah. barely. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's until, <laughs> until the Syrians really took over, it was very, very, uh, um, very assimilated. Yeah. So they have many, many, uh, you know, many presidents, prime minister, you know, ministers, whatever, all of Jewish origins. Yeah. Levi Maduro, you know, that was one of their presidents. presidents. I don't think <laughs> it was not halakhically Jewish, but of that. Yeah, yeah, it's well, interesting. She's from a Spartic background, um, and it's some of the Ladino is still put into uh -huh. the home customs uh -huh. that she she writes about. So nice. Hello, Professor Sarusti. How are you? Hello. And welcome. I just want to make sure everybody knows we have not started yet. That's why we're just having a little small talk. So talk amongst yourselves in the chat or put in where you're signing in from, because we already realized just with the speakers signing in, we're quite international. So please do throw into the chat where you're signing in from, and we'll let Professor Sarusi get settled, and then Professor Gerber and Gerber, sorry, and uh, Professor Perales can continue your conversation. <laughs> I, I turned you off, sorry. No, Hi, no. Edwin. No, not at all, not at all. Uh, oh, Dr. Sarusi, welcome. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Well, I'm mad. It's a real honor to have have you both. Uh, oh, see, we already have one person from um, from Morocco. So we have from Morocco and Orlando and Ottawa. Hmm. Where am I from? So throw it in there. And hello, Carolyn. Uh, Dora. Uh, yes. You will allow us to share the screen, so. You can share it. Do you want to try okay, now? Sure. Just okay. Share? Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, whenever the time comes, so come in. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can. You're a pre um, presenter, so you can always share. Yeah. Okay. It's not plain old Westchester. There's. It's interesting in Westchester. I think. I don't know. I've never been there actually. It's a rainstorm. Oh, Gloria, great to see you too. Sorry, you can continue. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know Gloria. Down. She's Gloria, first of all, is Vanessa's mom, but second, well, I don't know which is first, which is second, and she's also an amazing artist with amazing books. Um, so I have to put that out there. <laughs> We're very global here. Right? It's nice. Great. great. And we're going to Hi. give everybody a minute or two. Professor Gerber, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Nice to see you. You too. You too. Very good. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think we have a nice group of people to start. So again, we like to respect those who are here on time. So thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you for being on time. And uh, we're hoping to have a great conversation today because we have some wonderful people with us, as always. Um, so first of all, logistics, as always, those who are attending, your microphones and cameras are not available to be opened until after the presentations. Once we, do, um, once we complete the presentations, we will invite you to open your cameras and microphones because it's so much nicer to talk to an audience, I'm sure. All the professors here agree um, that it's much nicer when you actually see faces. But in the meantime, we don't want to be interrupted. So we're going to keep everybody else on mute and cameras off. So that's just the logistics. Um, so I want to go back to what I said a few weeks ago, that this is a New Works Wednesday that's very close to my heart. Uh, because obviously, I'm one of the editors of the book. And we have another editor of the book with us, um, Professor Garber, Gerber, why do I keep calling, I'm sorry, I don't know why I keep doing that. I'm just gonna say Professor Jane, how's that? 
<laughs> That's how they do it in Dubai. In case anybody wants to know, I met Dr. Ibrahim. Now everybody knows who Dr. Ibrahim is. Nobody knows his last name, but everybody knows Dr. Like how many Ibrahims are there? Sorry. So Professor Jane is also one of the editors here. <laughs> um, and I want to also obviously thank uh, Professor Ronnie Perellis and the Rabbi Arthur Schneier International Program of Yeshiva University. Um, before we begin, I also want to point out that our fall schedule is progressing nicely. We have a Latino music workshop again with Yeshiva University and a glimpse into Jewish Bukharan life in Uzbekistan, Mizrahi feminists, and uh, Provence in the Middle Ages, in addition to some wonderful New Works Wednesday after this one as well. Uh, we're going to also be commemorating the Day of Refugees on November 30th with a full day program, start kickstarting our campaign, Reclaiming Identities, which should be an amazing podcast series uh, in, starting in December. And we have Eid al-Banat on December 5th. Um, so there's a lot going on. Please do check the website, um, register, become members, make sure you're on our mailing list, et cetera, et cetera. Great, great pitch now. Now for today's focus. So today's um, focus is Jews and Muslims in Morocco, uh, intersecting cultures. And the reason that we um, decided to do this volume really started with the conference in 2019, the ASF Uncommon Commonalities, uh, conference uh, in the Center for Jewish History. And I also want to make mention that there was special thanks to the Association Mimuna for their support and encouragement of the conference. Um, for those who don't know, Mimuna is an organization started by Muslim college students in Morocco over a decade ago. And they wish to preserve the memory and of the history and culture, as well as the Jewish Muslim relations within Morocco today. And together uh, we had OCP Morocco providing the funding and from that conference, we began to really, actually, Professor Jane came and uh, said, this has to stay. This has to be for future generations. And not only that, we need to reach out to people even who weren't here because they're experts in the field and we have one and one here today. Um, so I wanna please note that that's, that's where it came from. And yet then the three, uh, <laughs> both of us approached Professor uh, Yossi Shitrit and really reached out to leading scholars and leading experts in multiple fields across the world. We have historians, anthropologists, musicologists, rabbinic scholars, Arabists, and linguists, and each of them uh, gave their own view into the hybrid history of intercultural exchange between Moroccan Jews and Arab and Amazi cultures. Um, so the interplay between different groups of Jews and the Muslim majority distinguishes Moroccan Jewry to this day. And anybody who's been to Morocco will definitely note that. Um, many cultural spaces and practices held in common by Jews and Muslims in Morocco originated during the era of the Almohad persecution. And if you read the book, you'll see the first chapter talks all about that. Um, however, for a majority of Moroccan Jews, both men and women who are unaware of these origins, the sets of shared beliefs, practices and values are a na natural part of their communal culture. Moroccan Jews have integrated them into their Jewish traditions, assimilated them, and made them an inseparable part of their myths and ethos. As is the case with cultural borrowings and other traditions, the social and individual meaning of these ancient borrowings did not remain static. In this manner, the popular culture of the Moroccan Jews is not only hybridized, but in reality constitutes a syncretic entity which coupled with rabbinical culture establishes its fundamentally dual character. One cannot speak of a simple case of cultural borrowing, but an intersection of cultures. These intersections are, ex are explored in a historical and political context, cultural commonalities, religious traditions, and memoirs. I wanna point out that memoirs are shown in visuals from Delacroix paintings. If you even notice, um, there's a copy of a Delacroix painting, although it's not an original. Uh, the originals are in the book and will hopefully be on the website. And I know Professor Sarusi is going to tell me that the website is not up yet and I have been in touch with them for so many times, but they apologized again that it's not up yet. There, it will be a very rich website and I'm sure Professor Sarusi will explain why. Um, but if you also in the book, it's, we have a memoir from Professor Shitrit and another from Professor Ahmed Chouari and 
you can already hear from their names that they must give a very different perspective of what it was like living there and what it was like living after there. Mm -hmm. And so it's an interesting concept of how to um, see the life and the idea is really to understand it from all vantage points. And I hope that we'll hear a little bit of it today. And I'm going to hand the floor over to Professor Perellis, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Dora. Um, I, I wanna just say, uh, I, I have the uh, honor to teach uh, Jewish history at Shiva University, and I focus on the history of the Sephardim and um, music in my teaching is, is so central to opening up the past and the living present to my students and giving them portals to go back in time. And uh, I'm so happy that we have here today people, scholars who could really plumb the depths of, of that past and show the layers and the complexities of that history and the people behind it. Um, so it's really, really an honor to be able to introduce uh, both of you here today. Um, um, should I introduce both at the same time, or no? Gonna... Do one and then next. Okay. So, so first we're gonna we first we're gonna um, we have the honor to hear from Professor Edwin Sarusi, who's the Emmanuel Alexander Professor of Musicology and Director of the Jewish Music Research Center at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His most recent book is Sound Ruins of Modernity. What a wonderful title. He's an internationally well known and respected musicologist and the leading authority on Jewish music. A vast repertoire of classical Arabic music composed in Cordoba and other parts of Andalusia spread to North Africa during the 9th to the 11th centuries and after. The ancient repertoire consisted of 24 mega symphonies or nubat. Only 11 nubat of the ancient 24 survived in Morocco at the end of the 18th century. In Jews and Muslims in Morocco, Professor Sarusi wrote the chapter entitled Liturgy an overlooked space in the Moroccan Jewish musical map, which is part of the section on religious tradition and addresses these nubat as well as bakashot and other liturgical pieces influenced by ancient Jewish rites, as well as contemporary Muslim poetic repertoire. Without any further ado, Professor Sarusi. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pirellis and- Reminding, please put yourself on mute, those. Thank you uh, for this kind invitation to draw a tireless, tireless cultural activist. Really, um, she can move mountains, as we say in Hebrew. Okeret Arim. And thank you for inviting me to be not only today, but also part of that important publication. And of course, to uh, my other colleagues, your co-editors, Professor Jane Gerber and Professor uh, Yossi Shitrit, with whom I basically share, believe it or not, almost 50 years of joint work. And we are relatively young, so when we started, we were more or less kids. But uh, Yossi was then already a luminary that uh, introduced me to the most musical culture of the Moroccan Jews, which was the topic of my MA thesis. Now, I won't want to disappoint you, Professor Perelis, but actually my article is against the Nuba. And I will explain uh, what I would like to uh, stress. Actually, my uh, article in a way is a little bit subversive in terms of this volume because it goes uh, on the surface against commonalities. It treats that space of community life that is actually secluded from the outside, the synagogue, and particularly not only the building of the synagogue, but of course, the rituals taking place in the synagogue, which usually are a space of intimacy, of uh, closeness of expression of ancient uh, religious uh, ideals and, and hopes uh, through prayer. And those prayers are performed with uh, diverse uh, degrees, as I call, of sonority. And purposefully, I'm not using the word music, because if you go to a traditional Moroccan synagogue, 
particularly on a weekday. Uh, what you're going to hear is very far from music, and I will play for you uh, some snippets uh, of, uh, of examples of how it sounds. It doesn't mean at all that the event is not deeply spiritual or that people performing are deeply engaged. What I just want to say is that the idea that the Jewish liturgy is a musical event is a very modern idea. So you can be perfectly okay uh, between you and yourself and between you and the Almighty by praying without singing one note. But you have to perform the text somehow. And obviously, human beings in all religions that I know, everywhere around the world, when they perform sacred texts, they perform that with a certain manner that is not a spoken manner, a regular or a daily spoken manner. But between music, and I'm using here music in the Western concept, and those types of, and, and reading or sp spoken language of daily language, there is a vast, a vast gamut of possible uh, sonic expressions. And this is what I address in uh, basically in my article, and uh, I am trying to explain how a Moroccan Jewish service works, and I found methodologically and also pedagogically, I was thinking, writing this article about students, you know, like you, Professor Perelli, you know, if you want to present in your class, so I, I give you a menu, like a, a roadmap of how to listen to uh, Moroccan uh, service, Jewish service. And I choose one of my recordings uh, done uh, exactly 41 years ago in the city of Tiberias. And that recording is what Drora was hinting before is supposed to be online because the article doesn't make any sense. I mean, not the, the whole article, but half of it uh, doesn't make any sense unless you can listen to those recordings. And we hope that the recordings are going to be very soon released. I will play for you now a, a couple of minutes of it, uh, as much as we have time. And uh, analytically speaking, what I show in this recording is that the sound of the synagogue uh, in Morocco, in spite of being a closed space uh, and a place of intimacy, as I said, even there it absorbs sounds coming from the outside world. And those sounds, as I show, uh, this service was recorded in Tiberias in 1980, uh, already includes not only expected sounds of the Moroccan soundscape, that is to say, what was mentioned here before by Professor Perelli is what is called the Andalusian music of Morocco, the, the dominant repertoire that everybody speaks about and everybody talks about, not always knowing exactly what they are talking about, but basically that's the music of Morocco. That's the music of the, that the, the king of Morocco, when you go to a reception, that's the music you hear at the palace. That music is, permeates a little bit into the Jewish liturgy and it permeated much more in modern periods than in the past, but also other layers of music that are a little bit later, particularly Arab music, non-Moroccan, okay? That is to say what I call the, the cosmopolitan Arabic sound, which is a name for uh, Egyptian popular music. And then even uh, some uh, in that service, you can hear a very famous Ladino song, which the Moroccan Jews learned in Israel. So these are later accretions that enter into this, if you want, a mishmash of different melodies that are inserted within a space that is uh, uh, basically not very musical. Now, I have to confess now, Dror, I never told you that, that I choose this uh, service. It's, a Rosh, it's an Aravit, Arvit, uh, uh, an evening service for Rosh Chodesh, for the new moon or the, for the new month. Uh, which is a little bit more musically embellished and it's performed in a synagogue 
where the main cantor was an excellent singer and he taught the children there. He had a class of Hazanut and, and piyut singing. So the kids sing marvelously. So not to attack the public with a too non-musical uh, service, I put something that is uh, bearable and can be uh, listened mostly with uh, great uh, uh, great enjoyment. So I, I will uh, just use the two, three minutes that I have left to play you a, a little bit of, uh, of uh, what I, I am talking about. So uh, if, I, if I don't give you examples, you will never know what I'm talking about. And this is what uh, it's important. So you will tell me if, uh, if, that, uh, if you can see my uh, screen. We see the screen, yes. You see the screen. Okay, so let's see if you can hear the music. So here we go. I, I want to tell you all field recordings that I, I did between 1979 and 1980. That's a, a period when I was an MA student and I was a very happy man. I was young. I had time. It's not like today that I cannot even think about doing a recording because I'm overwhelmed by the public sphere. But at that time, I was a, a no one, and, and that helped me a lot uh, to do all this work, going uh, to to Moshavim, uh, to to cities uh, like uh, Beit Shemesh, Netivot, Tiberias, and recording these recordings that now are historical documents. I mean, we can hear uh, uh, these uh, sounds uh, of uh, people who were at that time relatively immig uh, uh, new immigrants, okay? So if we take the Aliyah from Morocco, the immigration from 55, 56, 57, the big waves. So here we have a congregations that most of its members were still born and educated in Morocco. So this is uh, very important. Uh, it is remarkable, I have to say, that in places where uh, the Moroccan Jewish community in Israel kept itself uh, more or less in a, uh, in a sort of, um, I don't want to use this term, but endogamic uh, community, uh, you, you can still hear this even after two or three generations after the immigration, which is uh, amazing. So let's hear a few sounds. Amen. <laughs> Uh, what we have here then is the beginning of uh, of uh, of the formal prayer uh, on, on the morning in uh, Amushab uh, next to Beit Shemesh. So these people have to go to work. They have to go to work. They don't have time to start a symphony of beautiful Andalusian music and extended melodies. These things have to move very fast. But within that fastness, we have a pattern of sound that is distinctly Moroccan. This way of deploying the Kaddish by the cantor. And you can see that there are certain emphases. Certainly the call for prayer you have a, a certain accentuation and a certain pitch that it's different from the more fast recitation that is done on one sound. I don't want to become too musicological today. We don't have the time just for you to give you a sense of how this sounds. Let's uh, listen to another example. Uh, and then we'll listen to one example from the book. And I will end here uh, this uh, presentation.
This is the beginning of a service I recorded in Netivot, in the southern city of Netivot, uh, in 1979. It's a live, uh, this is a live recording. This is an actual service uh, during uh, the week. This is an evening service. Uh, again, for I'm bringing this so that you can appreciate different degrees of musicality. This is uh, a service uh, for Rosh Chodesh. So it starts with a very special song. The opening of this service, unlike the daily service, it has an additional song that refers to the new moon, to the, to the new uh, month, the beginning, the announcement of the new month. And it is performed with a distinctive uh, musical structure, which is very simple. You see the whole congregation is singing. They are not singing very much together. It's a little bit cacophonic, okay? And, uh, and of course, uh, technically, the recording was done with a little small cassette, the Sony cassette of that time. Uh, so the sound is a miracle that we can listen to these sounds today. Uh, all uh, my recordings are today digital and they are available at the website of the National Library in Israel. However, uh, what we hear here is uh, a pattern that it's very clear rhythmically. It's okay. La 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 di ra ra ra, ta di ra di ra ra ra, ta di ra ra di ra ra ra, and every pattern corresponds to one verse of the song. So when the when the verse is longer, the pattern expands. When the verse is shorter, it shortens. And this is one technique of performing song in Sephardic synagogues that goes beyond Morocco. These patterns, this is, in my opinion, one of the oldest stratum preserved by all Sephardic Jews or all the Jews who were connected to the Jewry in Spain, that you can hear these patterns very similar from Morocco on the, uh, on the west to uh, Iraq in the east. And this is uh, extremely remarkable. And I will finish with the recording of this book that we are talking about uh, today, which is much more musical. And I will open with the same song, but uh, uh, perform in a much more musical uh, way, okay? okay? What you hear at the beginning, I forgot to, to say, the uh, opening of uh, the uh, evening of, of every service in, in Morocco, it opens with a sort of Kabbalistic incantation. This is an addition that is unique to the Moroccan Jews. You won't find this in every other synagogue, in which the cantor ask for permission to, to pray on the name of the congregation. And the, this uh, prayer uh, is, uh, uh, has uh, Kabbalistic uh, um, uh, sources. I, I cannot go now into what it is, but look how he performs like an incantation, like a petition with a very, with a very uh, um, uh, soft voice. Okay, very soft. Okay. So on. Really, uh, an ancient uh, musical technique that keeps the synagogue as a place of intimacy. This music has nothing to do with any type of Moroccan music that we know from inside the synagogue. However, where where is the Moroccanness here? The Moroccan is in the intonation, in the way people sing, the technique, how it sounds. So a Moroccan Muslim, even if he had never heard a synagogue service, and even if 
he will never recognize this structure of music as part of the Moroccan heritage, he may recognize that way of singing, that those overtones that the singers are performing here uh, as typically Moroccan. And my last example is from the same service. <laughs> Now, okay, we have the same um, uh, call to prayer, the, the, the canto calls the congregation to prayer, Barichu, but that you heard in the previous uh, recording that I played for you is very unmusical. Here you have the cantor extracting from this little snippet of text Barichuet Adonai Meborach a tiny little Andalusian touch to it Barichuet Adonai Meborach which puts the music now a little bit more into its Moroccan context where I, you can claim that the Moroccanness of the, the soundscape of the Moroccan culture invades a little bit uh, the Jewish uh, liturgy. So this is, uh, uh, in a nutshell, my, uh, my uh, main argument in this article, which again goes against the grain, even criticizing myself for being so much seduced by the beautiful Andalusian music, where certainly the commonalities between Jews and Muslims are almost an homology. They're almost one-to-one, -one, okay? I always tell an anecdote. Uh, we had a concert in Marrakesh in a big congress in the mid '90s and the very beginning days of the uh, of the Oslo Accords and uh, the opening what was supposed to be a Institute for Jewish Studies in Rabat. And we had a concert, and three of the important Paitanim of Israel came, and the musicians were Muslims. And there was no rehearsal. I was terrified. How can a concert be done without any rehearsal? They went into the stage. They whispered to each other something. And the concert was like these people were performing forever together. So that space, that Andalusian music space, is almost identical between Jews and Muslims uh, for many, many uh, 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 centuries, in my opinion, mm -hmm. at least from the 16th century. However, there are certain genres or types of Andalusian music that are more Jewish, and the Muslims recognize that as being Jewish. And what is interesting, those Andalusian music spaces that are more Jewish, the Muslim musicians have great respect because they believe that the Jews kept more faithfully the Andalusian repertoire than the Muslims did, that the Muslim modernized while the Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, uh, sphere of, of Andalusian performance, particularly the Bakashot, the early morning uh, uh, um, uh, prayers uh, of uh, performing of Piyutim, uh, there you can find some uh, of, the, of the older stratum of Andalusian music. So my critique was that we pay so much attention to commonalities that we forgot the uniqueness of the Jewish sound. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that tour and for uh, uh, modeling what it means to, um, to present the thesis and counter thesis and to go against the grain and uh, it's, it's, you always learn more that way. So I appreciate that. And, and I, I want to now really read this uh, article. Uh, uh, hold on. And, and our next guest, uh, we move on to Professor Andre Elbaz, a professor of French at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. He's the author of Studies of Jewish Literature and History in France, North America, and Morocco. Moroccan Hebrew poets essentially borrowed separate melodies for composing Hebrew liturgical poems or piyutim on their rhythmical schemas. Professor El Baz wrote, um, Professor El Baz explores his poetry through his chapter on the image of Morocco in the poetry of Rabbi David Ibn Hazan um, from the 1700s in Morocco. 
And without further ado, we get a chance to go deep into another aspect of this music. And thank you so much. And before we get into the music, we're going to ask uh, Professor Elbaz, could you have to unmute first, please? No, you need to open your microphone. Hold on. Uh, Professor Elbaz, you have to open your microphone. Sorry, everybody. Give us a minute. Oh, do we hear you now? No? No, he's still mute. Okay. Here, Unmute. You see you have to unmute. Do you see there's a microphone on your screen? You had it before. Yeah. There. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Seroussi uh, because I, I found not only uh, instructive uh, his uh, presentation, but I was also very moved because I, it, make me, it made me remember uh, all the prayers that we had in Morocco and that we still uh, use today, even in Montreal. Uh, you would be surprised how much of uh, your presentation would be actual in uh, the syn in Moroccan synagogues uh, in Montreal. I'm sure that is the same in Israel and in other places where Moroccans continue to uh, respect their uh, traditions and their customs. Uh, now, I, coming Professor back to- Elbaz, I, yes. I won't be surprised at all. And I want to say only how glad I am to be with you together. It's such an honor for me. <laughs> well, for me, uh, when uh, you were presenting uh, your uh, uh, pieces of music, uh, for me, it's not something that I learned. It's something that I use. And it was my music and the way we pray. Baruch Hu et Hashem HaMevorach and uh, the Psalms uh, that were recited for Rosh Chodesh are everyday uh, activities that we have and that we continue to use exactly as you presented them. And I am uh, very grateful that you are able to present this in, an in a scholarly article that I hope will be available to the uh, greatest number of people. Coming back to uh, Rabbi David Ben Hassin, uh, Rabbi David Ben Hassin was, uh, is considered as the best known uh, Hebrew poet in not only Morocco, but North Africa. He's still very well known. Uh, his uh, poems are still sung today in synagogues, in uh, families, in uh, festivities, in communal or uh, family festivities. And uh, many of them have also entered into ritual prayer, prayer books, like some of his piyutim uh, uh, for Sukkot, for Pesach, for a Brit Milan. In fact, uh, uh, it's almost impossible to find now a Brit Mila, even though people don't know about Rabbi David Ben Hassin, but many people during a Brit Mila will start singing, and uh, our people don't know about the original author of uh, these poems, but they still remember the song because they used to sing it uh, when we were young and they continued singing uh, uh, either in Morocco and uh, they still continue doing it in Montreal. Uh, so uh, my colleague, uh, Ephraim Hazan, who is a specialist on uh, Moroccan and North African uh, PU team. And I decided uh, a long time ago, uh, about uh, 25 years ago, that Rabbi David Ben Hassin deserved to have a critical edition of his poetry because we were amazed to find that, where, whereas uh, many of us had written 
uh, books on, uh, for, for instance, French uh, poets or French uh, writers that expose not only their lives, their history, but also their art and their prediction. There was not a single book on any of our poets or any of our great Rabbanim, uh, where, uh, whether it be in Morocco or in other North African countries. And uh, we decided that we would present uh, the work of Rabbi David Ben Hassin exactly in a university way by checking the text, uh, checking the conditions of uh, uh, the writing of the poems. And we published a critical edition of uh, the poetry of Rabbi David Ben Hassin in 1999. Uh, I remember the reactions of some of the Israeli newspapers when uh, they saw this book. Uh, one of them noticed that up to, the, to that uh, year, 1999, when people spoke of uh, Moroccan Jewish culture, they spoke mostly of folk tales, of uh, customs and beliefs. Uh, in other words, Moroccan Jewry was uh, considered as uh, certainly a very exotic uh, part of the Jewish people with uh, very interesting uh, folklore, but uh, nobody ever thought of uh, Moroccan uh, Jewish culture as deserving to have a university type of exegesis of uh, presentation in such a way. And uh, uh, one of the uh, newspapers in Jerusalem wrote that he was uh, quite surprised to see uh, this type of, of book appear. Uh, we were very fortunate, uh, Ephraim and I, when uh, our book appeared that many students, several students, used exactly the type of format of uh, our book in order to present other poets and other writers. And this is exactly what we wanted uh, to do. If uh, you have any questions on... Uh... So let's, let's go back a few minutes first. Let's, let's yes. kind of put a little context. So um, first you mentioned that you were born in Morocco. So let's just get a little bit of your background in terms of how you grew up and how you saw yourself in Jewish life in Meknes and your relationship with the Muslims there. <laughs> okay. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in Meknes, in uh, the, uh, what is called the Nouveau Mela, the New Mela. Uh, Meknes was uh, a very special uh, Jewish town. It had two melas, the old mela built in 1682 by Mullah Ismail, uh, wanted to put all Jews together. And it's a very small place where people were packed together for centuries until around 1929, the French government allowed the Jews to build a new mela in more spacious uh, places. And uh, the new mela was indeed a very nice uh, district where we, you had uh, homes uh, uh, were uh, more comfortable and certainly uh, uh, more modern than the uh, uh, hovels uh, where people lived in the old mela. Unfortunately, until the disappearance of uh, the Jewish community of Meknes when everybody went to Israel or other places, uh, the old Mela continued to exist exactly as it was in the Middle Ages. I remember walking to go to Preminha or Arbit in uh, the old Mela. Uh, we had to walk uh, on the mud because the streets were not paved. Uh, we also, it was a very strange uh, district, the old Mela. Since there was no garbage removal throughout the centuries in the old Mela, 
people used to throw their garbage in the streets. So the street level went up and up so that after three centuries, the homes were lower than the street. So one very strange thing uh, that you could see when you walked in the old Mela was that the entrance of every home had stairs going down. You had to go down to the homes and not up and not on the same level. Uh, so, and uh, the, the place was still very, very small. And it was even sm made smaller by the inclusions inside of the walls of the old Mela because the, the old Mela was enclosed by enormous walls since uh, 1682. Uh, they had included inside the cemetery and the cemetery had grown uh, to capacity and evidently people didn't have enough space to, to, to breathe, to, to live. Anyway, I grew up in the new Mela. Uh, one has to know that in uh, old Morocco, there were three different populations, at least in my uh, period. There were Europeans who lived in uh, the new city. It was called the Ville Nouvelle, a new city. It was modern and uh, 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 full of uh, many uh, modern uh, uh, places. The Muslim quarter, which was usually rather poor, it was called the Medina, and the uh, Jewish ghetto, which was called the Mela, ever since uh, the 15th century. The first Mela was built in 1438 in Fez. Uh, the second one was built uh, about a century later in Marrakesh, and the third one in Meknes in 1682. Anyway, these three uh, districts were totally separated and their inhabitants were also separ lived separately. There was hardly any contact between Europeans, Jews or Muslims. We all lived in our own uh, area uh, together and uh, we hardly had any contact except uh, for uh, commerce or schools as we'll see with uh, the French who lived uh, in a different district. And certainly we had no contact at all with Muslims, except with uh, Muslims who, who sold us uh, uh, food or uh, some Muslim servants who came to, to work uh, uh, with Jewish families. Uh, we certainly had no contact with Muslim culture. We did have a lot of contact with French culture. Uh, for instance, uh, I went like everybody in, uh, to the school of the Alliance Israelite Universelle throughout my grade school. And after that, to the Lycée. Uh, the Lycée was a secondary school where all the education was in French. So we uh, were totally Frenchized. Uh, whereas most uh, Jews uh, spoke, all Jews in fact, spoke Judeo Arabic at home in the school of the Alliance Israelite and later in the Lycee and certainly later in universities, uh, we only spoke French. So we were exposed to the French culture exactly as uh, uh, children or uh, young adults were exposed to French education in Paris or Marseille. We had exactly the same kind of education. And that cut us somewhat from our traditional education. When we were in grade school, we went to the school of the Alliance during the day, but in the evening, somehow our parents sent us also to Talmud Torah on Sundays, we didn't have a vacation. We also went a whole day to Talmud Torah. When uh, summer months came, our French uh, co comrades went to the beaches or to travel and so on. We all went to Talmud Torah where we studied uh, Talmud and other uh, traditional texts. Uh, however, after the lycée, the secondary school, and certainly the university, 
we were kind of cut off from our traditional uh, culture, our traditional links with uh, our rabbis, our dayanim, who were very respected, but somehow they couldn't talk to us. They spoke only in Judeo-Arabic. And we spoke only French, more or less. They were incapable of transmitting to us uh, our uh, traditional lore, our traditional culture. And in a way, we were incapable also of understanding their way of uh, thinking and the way of uh, teaching. Uh, I remember uh, when uh, we went, when we were younger and we went to uh, Talmud Torah, the Melamedim had uh, medieval, the medieval pedagogy. They really didn't know how to teach and basically their teaching was translating psukim from the Torah into Arabic and repeated that, repeating that until we knew perfectly the Hebrew and the Arabic. Uh, it was very useful for me because we used to speak French uh, at home. My parents came from Algeria, uh, but I learned Arabic that way by translating Hebrew into Arabic. Uh, I want to make sure, since we only have a few more minutes, I want to make sure um, you talk about that uh, uh, David Ben Hassin had, um, he expressed the mental outlook of the Jews of Morocco. Um, yes. And so I, I wanna, you said you didn't have a lot of contact with the Muslims, but it seems from his poetry that there was negative contact. <laughs> um, well, and also that he loved to, Morocco. To say the least, to say the least. Uh, David and Hassin lived in a very uh, difficult part of uh, Moroccan history. After the death of uh, Mullah Ismail in 1727, that was the year Rabbi David ben Hassin was born, uh, there was a, uh, an endless war of succession where people were just uh, slaughtering one another. There were so many sultans, uh, everyone, uh, making war on his brother, on it, and Jews suffered a lot because uh, whichever army arrived in a city, they started by looting, raping, killing the Jews. And Rabbi David Hassin lived through that period. He was also very poor. An artist uh, never makes uh, much money, and he had to travel despite the difficulties and the insecurity, he traveled from uh, city to city. He traveled in Southern Morocco, he even uh, traveled to Gibraltar uh, by crossing the Straits. Uh, you know, when he was invited to come, he had a reputation as a, a very pleasant uh, Paitan. So he was invited everywhere and he made some money that way. He uh, also tried to, uh, to make money uh, to supplement his earnings uh, in other ways, but he wasn't very successful. Uh, one interesting uh, part was uh, he tried to, uh, to sell alcohol to Muslims. Uh, alcohol, uh, Muslims were very fond of a uh, type of alcohol made by Jews called mahya. Uh, mahya. Uh, means exactly uh, the water of life. <laughs> so uh, it ended in disaster for uh, Rabbi David ben Hassin. Uh, he was, he became very respected after uh, uh, being a Python for so long. He ended up in 1774 being appointed as one of the Hachamim Reshumim of Meknes, uh, which, which means uh, one of the uh, the official rabbis of the uh, Meknes, and he even signed some takanot, but he died very poor. He had one son, one only son, and tradition says that he had nine girls, nine daughters, and it was uh, very tough at the time to have nine daughters and to marry them. He was very successful in marrying them to uh, 
good husbands and uh, respectable family in respectable families. But he died a very poor man. He died in uh, 1792. However, he was a very active man, and he succeeded in putting a little less than 200 of his poems on paper and somehow managed to have uh, three successful businessmen from Mogador. Mogador was a city where uh, a tradesmen and uh, uh, a businessmen lived at the time and had connection with England, with Holland and so on. And three businessmen from Mogador agreed to take his manuscript to Amsterdam and his manuscript was published 15 years after his death in Amsterdam and was probably, it was printed in a very uh, small number of copies, probably 300 that, that seems to have been the number of uh, volumes printed for an unknown rabbi at the time. Anyway, it was 300 copies arrived in Morocco and immediately they were, uh, were, were sold out and uh, those, uh, those books became so precious that people started uh, copying them by hand. Uh, and he became very famous throughout Morocco and North Africa. Thank you. I want to make sure we have time for people to also ask questions. So I'm going to cut sure. you off. I apologize. But, uh, okay. Professor Pirellis, do you see the chat? I'm inviting people. Please open your cameras and your microphones. So I'm going to. Nope, you don't. Right. Until uh, there are questions, of if after there are questions, I would like to add the. Uh, just a brief remark to Professor Elbaz's uh, Please. presentation. Uh, first of all, Professor Elbaz, I'm very sorry I couldn't be part of the book. Professor Hazan, my dear yes. beloved problem, yes. he uh, asked me to write a chapter about the Lechanim, about the melodies that uh, Rabbi Hassin, who, who was certainly very well informed in music and probably he knew how to perform, his poems, uh, he designed to many of them a melody and he put the name or the first line of the melody in yes. the manuscript. Uh, and I apologize that I still have the file, you won't believe it, with the list of the Lehanim. Yeah. And, I didn't, and I didn't give up, one day I will do it. Uh, and uh, we will round up uh, your amazing uh, and beautiful edition of the poems. Secondly, Rabbi David Hassin's most, in my opinion, popular poem. It's a poem that I found it in Iraqi manuscripts already in the mid 19th century that shows how fast his poetry went to the, to the East. And that's the beautiful poem in the city, in the honor of the city of Tiberia, Ochil Yom Yom, Ochil Yom Yom, which is uh, like uh, using uh, modern terms, it's a schlager today. Of, yes. uh, of Paitanim all around the Mediterranean and in the East. And uh, I heard Yemenites performing that uh, poem too. So uh, that's uh, uh, one of the most um, most successful modern Hebrew poets, poems, I would say. Reli yes, some religious, of his, religious poems, yeah. Some of his poems arrived in Calcutta. Calcutta is Iraq for all practical yeah. purposes. And, yeah. and a small Indian book where yeah. there is a poem yeah. from yeah. Abid yeah. Abid Ben Hassin. Yeah. 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 But these are the Jews yeah. of the Jews of Baghdad who settled in Calcutta. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, Rabbi, Rabbi David Ben Hassin indeed composed all his poems according to the melody of other poems. In only a small number of his poems did he choose uh, an Arabic melody that he indicated. In fact, not only did he imitate the melody of those Arabic poems, but sometimes he even imitated the words. For instance, uh, one of them was uh, El Haviv Li Hibato, and he indicates that it was composed according to an Arabic song, which is El Habib Li Habitu. El Habib Li Habitu means the uh, the man that I loved, 
and uh, he uh, translated, he put it in his poem, El Haviv Li Hibato. He was trying to imitate uh, the, uh, the very sounds of Arabic. Uh, only a few of his melodies, that, uh, according to what he indicates, were directly taken from Arabic songs. Most of his beauty follow the melody of other beauty, yeah. other known beauty yeah. in that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, other beauty whose melody was very well known to the congregation. Yeah. So uh, that, yeah. so that, in a way, uh, those indications, those indications of melodies, uh, played the role of musical notes, uh, because people saw, oh, you have to sing according to this uh, melody, yeah, yeah, and yeah. everybody knew how to sing uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The, the song itself. Right. Yeah, regarding the musical notes, there is also a very famous passage in the introduction to Tehilale David, to the book you mentioned yes. published in Amsterdam, where uh, Rabbi David has seen, uh, tells about the trip he made to Gibraltar, Yes, and in so, Gibraltar, yeah. if you remember that passage, he oh. is amazed to see the musicians performing yeah. all sorts of instruments while That's looking it. at papers that yeah. have lines the, and the, dots. Lines and yeah, dots. Lines and dots. And, and he was amazed to see <laughs> how they could uh, play their uh, yeah. instruments according to those lines and dots that he had never seen in his life. Yeah. And yeah. He, in yeah. fact, he, uh, he indicated that uh, the musicians, while looking at the, uh, the lines and dots and playing their, uh, instruments. their instruments, also marked the melody by uh, uh, by put, uh, by moving their their feet, their feet. On, the, on, the, on the ground. And so it, it's very very interesting to see how one of our Paitanim in the 18th century discovered modern. Uh, writing yeah. of music with uh, notes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I want to note that I invited everybody to be to to be moved to participant. Please note that does does presenter, but please note that that doesn't mean that you're supposed to be presenting. It just means that you can open your camera so that we can actually see you. So I know some of you are camera shy, but I want to put it out there that uh, please do accept it if you're open to being part of it. Um, Professor Perales, do you see one of the questions? There's one question here. Uh, I've learned the piyut ochil yom before in a liturgical class, but I believe it was a tune from Salonika. Would Professor uh, Sarusi be able to sing a snippet in the Moroccan tune? Yes, but I agree to sing only if Professor Elbaz joins me. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I will. Uh, something like this, okay? Oh, Yom Yom However, Professor Serusi, this yeah. is not the authentic melody of Ohilion. The authentic uh, yeah. melody is sung in Meknes and Fez, <laughs> we, uh, which are very conservative, very conservative uh, places. And the, the real melody is Oh, yom yom eshta e, oh yom yom eshta e, eni tamit Sofia, mataya vover e, admat kodesh Now I tell you a little. Uh, this uh, would be of interest to Professor Serusi about the conservatism, the melodic the musical conservatism of Make Moroccan music. Jews. Yeah. And I, I'll give you th this, uh, this is a very interesting anecdote. Uh, when I was a student, I was once in the city, uh, at the University of Bordeaux and on Shavuot, 
And I went to synagogue on Shavuot, and a rabbi who looked like a priest at the time with his robe yeah. <laughs> came to me and said, please, uh, sir, I see that you are new here. Uh, do you know how to sing the Haftarah? I said, yes. So he invited me to sing the Haftarah, and I sang the Haftarah exactly as we did in Meknes. Okay. After uh, service was over, the rabbi comes to, comes to me and says, Sir, I was amazed to hear you sing the Haftarah. How did you learn the old melodies of the old Portuguese Jews of Bordeaux? <laughs> I, was, I was amazed in my train. I never heard of the Portuguese Jews of Bordeaux. And then I, I thought about myself, I said, indeed, in Bordeaux, a lot of Portuguese Maranos came back during the centuries and settled in Bordeaux mm -hmm. and became Jews again mm -hmm. and sang their melodies exactly as we used to sing them in the Iberian Peninsula. Meknes was full of uh, expellees from Spain and as very conservative people, they kept the melodies exactly as they were for 500 years. And here I come from Meknes to Bordeaux and I sing the Haftarah and the rabbi who, who knew about the Portuguese melodies recognizes my melody as the same as the Portuguese uh, Jews of Bordeaux. Uh, I, I, I was very moved by uh, that discovery that we were so conservative as to keep the melodies for more than 500 years, exactly as the Portuguese Jews of, of Bordeaux and Bayonne in southern France kept them. But could I venture a, a different reading? And, and you as a musicologist, you can help, you can shoot this down. My understanding is that when the, the, the former conversos resettled in Amsterdam and the, the, their satellite communities, that they, one of the areas they brought Chachamim and Chazanim from was Morocco. There were a lot of commercial yes. in Morocco. No, not too many, and, but yeah. some of them certainly, yes. They did. So, so that, that one, of the under, one of the explanations for the style and the tunes of the Western Sfaradim is, is a replanting from Morocco that then gets set then then gets uh, translated throughout throughout the the, the Western diaspora because um, it, it's hard to Im I, I'm, you, you know you ex help me here it's hard to imagine people who were living like Catholics for a hundred years before they even get to these places like like Bordeaux or, or 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 certainly Hamburg or Amsterdam would be able to maintain that when they're not praying. They're 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 praying in very uh, you know in very rudimentary ways, like to maintain that musical tradition that strongly, um, is is really I, I don't know it feels a little bit too much. Um, that well, I think it may make more sense that the Moroccans come later and bring the, well the Jews of Bordeaux, you know the yeah. Iberian the Iberian style. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing that out. I'm really curious what you, what you both think on that. And well, the, the Jews of Bordeaux and Bayonne uh, didn't remain Christian for hundreds of years. Immediately from the 16th century on, many of those conversos either traveled to North Africa, in fact, to Morocco, in order to become Jews again. Our rabbis state very clearly, our chronicles state very clearly that uh, hundreds, literally hundreds, maybe thousands of Jews came back from Spain and Portugal in order to be Jews in Morocco. Uh, and uh, Portuguese Jews who settled in Bordeaux to escape the Inquisition, no conversos evidently, but very fast were tolerated as Jews. We know that after the works of uh, uh, now, uh, now Professor Naon uh, uh, wrote extensively on Bordeaux and Bayonne Jews, yeah. and he explains how they had settled there. Uh, and they had synagogues functioning in Bordeaux uh, from maybe the 17th century on 
even though Louis XIV had forbidden Jews uh, to, to act as Jews, they, they were tolerated. They were tolerated because they were very good businessmen and they had a tremendous business between France and America, for instance. Yeah. So they were tolerated as Jews. And they, uh, in fact, we have uh, many documents for that uh, period uh, of Bordeaux Jews as Jews, uh, as uh, Professor Naon has uh, shown in his uh, many publications. Uh, now, I never heard of uh, rabbis from Morocco going to Bordeaux, Bayonne, that area. Uh, that area uh, was uh, inhabited by very proud uh, uh, Portuguese Jews, as they called themselves, even though they were not all Portuguese, they were Spanish, but they called themselves Portuguese. They, they were so proud that they wouldn't invite uh, uh, Rabbanim from uh, Morocco to come. Whereas they did inv uh, invite Moroccan rabbis in Hamburg and Amsterdam and London also, uh, and uh, maybe yeah. even in America at one time. Yeah. Well, I, I can add, but I don't know how much time we have, but uh, I'm glad. Yeah, we'll take five more minutes. It, okay, it, uh, it looks like Professor Perelis is a very good student and uh, he must have read some, uh, some articles that I wrote exactly about that, particularly about the beginning, the very beginning of the liturgical tradition in Amsterdam, who became the mother of all communities. And Professor Elbaz, I think that Bardot Bayon did have enough ties to Amsterdam to import actual uh, yeah. personnel from there. The first two great Hazanim of, uh, of Amsterdam, uh, one came from Saloniki, and his name was Josef Shalom Gallego, and he published a very important book in Amsterdam with all his songs. And uh, this is why there is a layer in the Portuguese, so-called Portuguese Western Sephardic liturgy that is similar to Saloniki. And the other one, a Professor Elbaz, was Rabbi Uziel, Tzchak Uziel, who, uh, in one of the sources, he is described as Taniedor de Arpa, which means that he played the oud. Okay, the Arpa, I am convinced that their meaning, the meaning is a laud, and a, a, a laud, a lute, and this lute coming from Morocco couldn't be a, a Western lute, but only a oud. So, uh, and, and he was a poet too, and he composed melodies. So, uh, according to melodies, so therefore, there is a, a, a very important component, uh, both from the Eastern Mediterranean and from North Africa, embedded in the Western Sephardic uh, yeah. traditions. Mm -hmm. And okay. that's true what you said. I agree certainly that Bordeaux Bayonne had their own. Uh, how do you say their own uh, shtick, if I may use yes. another language, another Jewish language, but uh, they uh, they did interact. The Moroccan cantors were in other places in southern France uh, later on, like in Nice and 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 uh, in uh, certainly uh, in uh, Marseille. And uh, but mostly important, the Moroccan influence was very important in Livorno. So Livorno, mainly because of the printing press, many Chachamim spent very long periods of time. And uh, of course, Achida was also in Livorno, but uh, uh, the, the Livornese tradition, which is another branch of the Western Sephardic tradition, also has embedded uh, many uh, melodies uh, from that, that are from the family of the Moroccan melodies. Regarding Meknes, I agree with you. I know all my friends from Meknes. They're very proud. They are patriots. This is why I always say, you know, we talk about Moroccan Jews, but within the Moroccan Jewry, there is uh, um, a cert certainly a local patriotism that is important. When I started to work on the Bakashot in the 70s, I was interviewing mostly people from Casablanca. And the, the usher of the National Library in Israel, where I worked all my life, he once stopped me and said, I heard you are recording Moroccan music. He said, yeah, I'm recording this Paitan and that Paitan. He said, why are you recording them? What about us? You know, he was from Meknes. He was from Meknes and he was offended that I was paying attention only to the mainstream tradition. And in my article, I speak about these power relations between the new center in Casablanca, which is a totally new, invented, modern milieu 
influence, as you said, not only by the Alliance, but also by the Ecole Pratique uh, that, uh, that raised all the teachers that spread throughout Morocco in the 20th century. And they brought to, to the normalization of the Jewish liturgy, sort of erasing the very local traditions like the one from Fez, from Meknes, and even from Isawira, from, uh, from uh, Mogador. And, and from Marrakesh. So this is very interesting when we speak about Morocco to be aware uh, not only of the different ethnic backgrounds of the Jews, uh, but also about the locality of the proudness of the local traditions. Yeah. I do, uh, I do uh, want to be careful of the time, but I think Stanley had a question. Is that true? I thought you had a question in the group. Oh, good. So then I want to make sure it's not, it's, whatever time it is in your neck of the world. It's 15 minutes past the hour where I am at <laughs> 15. Um, but I wanna say thank you so much, Professor Sarusi and Professor Elbaz for taking the time and the sharing your brilliance with us. And um, I, there's plenty to read that both of you have written that it could take time and time again. And thank you, Professor Perales and Professor Gerber for joining us. And thank you all for joining, whether you opened your cameras or not. So we appreciate seeing you, hearing from you, and being part of it. And I hope to see you soon. Have a great Thank rest you. of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.